And I think we're live, right? Oh, we are. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, as we uh, sort out the technology, uh, which will challenge us, I'm sure, um, uh, it's good to be part of this event. Um, uh, never has there been a better moment for connecting cultures. And uh, we are less connected currently, yet more connected than ever. Um, so uh, the question is, what is the new norm? What's the future? We're just waiting for my next slide to come up. <laughs> Hello, Diana, Marta, Susan and Louise. Great to, great to see you here. Um, Ray and I are not the uh, technical whizzes that we would like to be, but we will have some, and hi Jenny and Minerva from Helsinki. Um, but we do have some great ideas, I think, about how we can make things better through this period of what I'm thinking of as the Corona Coaster. Are you ready to go with your slides, Ray? Yep, yep. Hey. Here we go. Yeah. So sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but we got a we got a buffer zone at the end uh, for Q and A, which uh, we normally buy into. Uh, so yes, uh, as I uh, explained, uh, what's the new norm? What's the new future? Um, uh, so the world is at a crossroads, and indeed the UK is at a crossroads, socially, economically, environmentally and politically. Uh, now our future relationships, and indeed our role in the world, can it be dictated by reacting to circumstance or maybe directed by our belief in what we want to be? And the UK has historically uh, chosen those uh, futures, uh, and we are at that crossroads at the moment. Uh, now in terms of the speakers, uh, so lucky to have James on, he'll introduce himself uh, later on, uh, but obviously this information here you've already got. So I'll just give you a little bit of a uh, synopsis. Uh, some commentators define us as specialist visitor attraction architects, uh, but we see ourselves more as strategists. And occasionally we're allowed to create economic development and we define that as built environment, landscape and infrastructure. And that facilitates the uh, staging of high economic performing visitor experiences. Now, I always like to start with a quote, and, and, and this book here presents so many wonderful quotes. If you haven't got this book by your bedside, I recommend it highly. Um, now, what uh, this book is very good at, it explains who, why, and what we are as a species. And that's really important, because sometimes we take it for granted that things like culture is a given, uh, and it's not. And so if I just read this out, you can see it on the screen anyway. But the immense diversity of imagined realities that sapiens invented and the resulting diversity of behavior patterns are the main components of what we call cultures. Now, once cultures appeared, they never ceased and still never ceased to change and develop. And these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. Now, so as a species, we made a transition. We went from a biological survival existence, effectively, we eat, drink, sleep, reproduce, and die. And we turned into an imagined reality species where cultures began to be invented. Now, humans are, are unique in this. We are curious, we imagine. And these behaviors have allowed us to develop attitudes and values about society we want to belong to, and most importantly, the future society we wish to become. These are the imagined realities. And that creates a history. Now, we are at a cultural crossroads. Uh, socially, economically, environmentally, and politically. Now, just uh, to prove this, uh, just by two pictures, the bottom left-hand picture is the same as the uh, bottom right-hand picture. The only difference is the soldier's outfits. So we went from uh, pre-1914, uh, we had a, a major schism in the world, and what came out of that was a universal suffrage in 1918. So we imagined a reality where everybody was eligible to, to vote and that's democracy so that was a really big imagined reality uh, so the combat outfits turned into ceremonial as a, as a social as a social norm the other one i tend to use and again is after the second uh, world war where we imagined reality where all health was free at the point of need and that was the welfare state and um, and a lot of commentators talk about we changed from a warfare state to a welfare state, and that's where we are now. And it's gonna be very interesting if COVID is one of those major schisms, and uh, what would be the new norm? What would be the uh, uh, imagined reality for the future? Now, we believe everything and everywhere has been created uh, through these imagined realities. 
Um, now, tourism then has a much bigger canvas than I think uh, many people think. Uh, so it's an underexploited um, uh, canvas and an underexploited resource for us to do. So to give an example on the left here, we have uh, the following tourism experiences. Now, some uh, are exploited, others aren't. So sport, we have the Olympics, festivals, education, health, global politics, science and engineering. Some of these just aren't seen as tourism pro uh, products and experiences. We think they should be. And these connect us. These, these cultural uh, ideas uh, connect us really strongly, and we should exploit them much further than we actually do. But how can we exploit these cultural connections? Um, creating more positive uh, social interaction, uh, peace and prosperity, effectively. And uh, so prosperity, the economic benefits that come from these cultural connections. Now, we, we believe there are two imagined realities that connect uh, cultures. What we, in tourism, that is. And we believe there's a host destination. Now, we have a phrase we use, which is, you have to love your own city before others love it too. And therefore, the host destination has to either reinforce or create a sense of an imagined reality. Great cities have done this through history. Other cities are beginning to learn uh, that. And of course, the yin to that yang is the tourist expectation. So the marketed uh, attraction then sows a seed in a potential tourist mind. And that's an expectation. Now, as we always say, when the tourist then gets attracted, visits, that expectation should be exceeded. Now, those are two imagined realities that don't actually exist until they come together. And therefore, the cultural connection is very, very powerful. Equally, um, we are used to maybe connecting into the major capitals maybe of the world. And we show you a, a swatch here of all the capitals, in this case of Europe and just beyond. Uh, but the second cities and third cities, they, they actually have more capacity and maybe more interest. And this can actually decentralize the tourism uh, model much further. And so we, we're actually looking ourselves at second cities to actually develop them into really strong tourism products. And just to show you what the potential is, now these are the stats uh, that um, effectively come off the web. And as you can see, 2020 is taking a dip. Obviously 2020 hasn't finished yet, and so therefore I think it's gonna dip a bit more. But the commentators suggest that we can have about a minus 5% growth as opposed to this continual linear growth, uh, but then it should bounce back. And of course it will bounce back. But uh, uh, we were already pre-COVID developing business development workshops. And, um, and the purpose of that was, was to effectively create fantastic improved visitor destinations for people to visit. That's not just for the UK market, that's for, for everyone. And if people here attended the Connecting Culture um, uh, where we presented our workshops, we, we showed the Alberta experience we, we, we had. Uh, and that's really been uh, quite successful. Um, fundamentally, we had three cities there. We had Banff, uh, which was the Alpine uh, skiing resort. We had Calgary and we had Edmonton. And we looked at imagining the reality of what those destinations could be. And then we're working on the individual attractions and those individual attractions improve, but they make up the the portfolio, if you like, of a city. And so what you get now is a destination which is balanced. We use gap analysis and the like, uh, as well as actually improving, um, uh, which sometimes you, you get a cannibalization of, of attractions in cities when actually there should be a really rich mix and they actually collaborate into a whole destination. Um, and those, and those uh, workshops now, which were business development pre-COVID, we're now converting those into post-COVID recovery workshops Different context, but fundamentally it's the same. It's just where we have, we're working with places 3% above the line, we're now 3 to 5% below the line. So we actually have to come out to neutrality and then push on. But the thing is, this gives us accelerated advantage for anybody that does these workshops. Now, just to really reinforce what the potential is, and as I said, this, this is actually um, the stats of what tourism now is now and what's really intriguing as you can see the global gdp in tourism is, is estimated at 5.9 trillion dollars now what's really curious about that number is that only represents the activity of 1.3 percent of the world population and even if you just doubled that 
that's worth six trillion dollars of of um, economic benefit, and that's really that's such a low number. And then with the big big um, economies and the big uh, societies coming on stream, that's gonna that's gonna hit those targets. Uh, but who's gonna benefit from that? And how can we redistribute that, that potential? Now we have an interesting. Um, series or, or, or circles of cultural connections ourselves they historically come from our imagined realities we have obviously uh, the commonwealth we have our, our north american uh, link um, whether that's actually by trade or by defense uh, that's nato uh, and of course we have europe now we are we are fortunate in the uk to have those circles but also connected into all the other countries as well but what this sort of starts to show is that the uk has an economic cultural connection with over 34% of the world's total GDP. But, it has a UK, but the UK also has an economic cultural connection with over 42% of the world's tourism revenue. So there's great potential anyway, but look at the expansion of that and where the potential is. And I said, we obviously want to help the UK use that to get that benefit, but also we want to work with our other partners to actually benefit that as well. And so therefore, um, the next slide really shows our next steps in, in this strategy, which is um, uh, we've been held up by COVID. We're, we're going to have uh, a strategy of connecting into the EU27 uh, and where they were just ba basic business development workshops. We're now calling them destination recovery workshops. Then we're going to move into a Commonwealth and then finally into the, into the US. And in fact, we're just going to look at um, cities and destinations and improve them. And, and try and grab that potential marketplace and the economic benefit but each really culturally connecting because the more people meet more empathy and peace and prosperity grows future targets in this strategy uh, we're looking at obviously south america africa middle east southeast asia but fundamentally i think the whole globe um, it is a potential for us to do really good um, cultural connectivity. Now, I'm going to leave that there and uh, I'll wait for questions. And I'm going to hand over to James now, who's going to introduce himself and give you some other uh, useful, maybe tactical uh, ideas and some strategy as well. So over to you, James. Thank you, Ray. Um, I just want to say that thanks for that. That introduction, Ray, and what you said there, I really enjoy thinking Hi, about James, what you, you were saying about cultural connections and the way that culture's made. And I really like the 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 way that destination and expectation were two kind of imagined realities. When we talked about this before, I, I'll be honest, I'd kind of got it. But listening to you this morning, I really feel like I understand that idea. And I, <clears throat> I'm going to reiterate what you said about sapiens being really useful. I quote it quite a lot in um, in the beginning of my my second book. Uh, but that idea of imagined realities that we have, you know, the idea of the UK is a construct. It, it is something that exists in our heads and our heads only. And the idea of tourism is only possible because we find it exciting to do things like, let's say, go to the beach. Beaches used to be kind of void places, but now we realise they're fun. If you think about the Alps, it used to be the case is the case that um, the southern facing slopes were the most valuable, but then skiing came along and it became the north facing slopes. Oh. Okay, good morning, everyone. So um, first of all, thanks for having me um, to the organizers, to Ian Clapperson, but also to Ray for inviting me. I'm gonna share um, a screen now, share my screen. Um, and I've got a deck to share with you guys that I think will play up this idea um, of connecting cultures. Very brief introduction to me. I'm, I describe myself as an experienced economy evangelist. I've written a couple of books on this. I wrote one book called Stuffocation about how we've all had enough of stuff and we want experiences instead. So this was, um, came out in 2013 originally, uh, was then published by Penguin, um, became a bestseller. And uh, I've given talks on this all around the world, but the key message was that we've, ha we've got a lot of stuff, but really what we want is experiences. The next book is called Time and How to Spend It, which is about how to design experiences, and it's all based on science. And I work for the, for the Department for International Trade. And I wanted to, to think about this idea of where we are here, and I'm thinking of our problem today as the Corona Coaster. That's why I've used this image. So how can experienced economy organizations 
destination management companies, um, creators of attractions and museums, retailers, anyone who's creating something that has something to do with the experience. How can we survive this period of what I'm thinking of as the Corona coaster, this horrific um, roller coaster that we're going through and then emerge stronger? And I hope this is going to give um, you, you guys some ideas, but also this is going to be a call to action. It's going to be a real call for you guys to do something too. Okay, so the starting point here is to say that the UK is very small. It's a There's a big world out there. The UK is a very small collection of islands. But in other ways, I think we're kind of mighty. Um, and I want to make a comparison here. I think the UK is the opposite of Vegas. I don't, I don't know if you've ever had the joy of going to Vegas. But I, I love this line that, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But I think what happens in the UK goes around the world. You can think of that in terms of uh, economic policy ideas, think about monetary policy. You can think about this in terms of punch drunk or secret cinema. But you can think about ideas that have, or you think of cricket or uh, football. Uh, but, you know, ideas that started there that have gone around the world for all sorts of reasons. So I think we're in a an interesting place here and look, I, I, Ray lives in the south of London I live in the west of London London is a obviously an exciting place and one of the things that makes it exciting is we've got people from everywhere here every everyone in London is some kind of um, immigrant and we are therefore connected to all sorts of places so I think the UK is mighty in terms of the connections we have we have the commercial connections Ray talked about um, I think he said that we're connected to 34 percent of the world's GDP of course we have you know, commercial relationships with countries around the world. And, um, but we also have personal connections individually. Think about yourself. And I saw lots of people that, um, coming in there from Turku in Finland, uh, uh, from I think Helsinki in Finland, Barbados, uh, Spain. Just think all of you probably have either possibly lived here at some point, but you've got friends here. It's an incredible personal connections that we have all around the world. Um, and then we have cultural connections through our organizations as well. And there's also kind of think about some of the ideas that, you know, um, you know, some of the British music that will go around the world. So we have that kind of connection through culture as well. OK, so I run workshops, innovation type workshops. Uh, I'm doing some work with a company called Kuoni, a big travel firm next week. I've got a two day workshop with them doing innovation. And a really useful thing is to think about, OK, why don't we? And then we'll think about how might we. So my thought here is. As we ride the Corona coaster, why don't we? And this is uh, this is all of us actually. It's not just people in the UK, but people. Obviously, I'm in the UK, so is Ray. Um, why don't we use the connections we have to help people in the experience economy ride this Corona coaster and come out stronger? And how might we do that? And I've played with this with um, some people, and I've come up with an idea. And essentially, it's this. And this comes from my background as a futurist. Um, I've been writing uh, about the future since 2004, forecasting what will happen. And the key starting point is you do research, you look for insights, experiences that you might have had. You then share those. Once you've shared, you then say to the people you shared, well, what have you come across? What ideas have you seen that would help experience economy organizations figure out how to ride the Corona coaster better? We can gather those as insights um and then we can share those back again and just to explain a little bit more an idea of how this might work so in terms of the sharing i came up with this idea of you know this idea of twin towns so uh, because of the whole staycation thing where we can't go abroad and very sadly i didn't go to uh, go to spain this summer i was and the family was very upset but we were we were here in the uk and every time you go to a town in the uk they seem to have a sign outside saying twinned with often places in France and Germany, but also the US. And this came out of the Second World War, post Second World War, where they wanted to connect people so that there would be less likely of conflict in the future. But also this idea of exchange of ideas. And I think what we could do is create experience twins where we connect with people on a regular basis and say, what's working for you? What's what, what's working? You know, this is what's working for me. This is the challenges we're having. But here's some ideas that we tried and they made sense. What's working for you? One of the things that's really powerful here, um, I was talking to someone at Google yesterday, and she used to run something, a CMO uh, get together. And she'd have different chief marketing officers from different industries talking to each other. And they weren't in direct competition. And one of the magical things about that is they've got the same kind of job, but in a different kind of area. And so, for example, you could be someone, you could be at the National Portrait Gallery in London who might team up with someone or twin with someone at MoMA. Or you could be at, um, you know, a, a, a smaller museum, let's say, in uh, Bristol, 
who team up with a museum in um, Turkey, in Finland. And I thought here as well, odd twins are fun. And what I mean by that is you don't need to be the same kind of size and shape. You don't need to be a national institution with 300 uh, staff. You could also team up with, with a very different kind of organization. So you could work with an, an escape room in another place. You could work with um, an immersive theater company. This idea of triplets is really just taking the idea of twins. The idea is that we'll do the sharing. Um, so what we'll do is if you start on the left hand side here, you'll see uh, research insights experience. So what we could do is think about the innovations we've seen in this time of the coronavirus and then move to the second circle. We share those with three groups, three, three people. They could be our twins. So our experienced twins in other countries. And then, of course, once you've shared, you they say, hey, what have you found out? And we share. And what we'll do this is my intention is we can gather those together. And we can put together a report called How to Survive the Corona Coaster. Doesn't have to be this way, but if we do that, what we're then doing is we're continually sharing. And what I think we'll do is we'll each find out there are other ways we could do things that will help us come up with better ways to survive this very difficult period. And as a result, we'll come out of it stronger with better ideas that are more relevant for today's and tomorrow's customers. This is from Joe Pine. Um, I was connected with Joe Pine. He is the guy who wrote The Experience Economy. He made this really great point in a discussion on um, LinkedIn the other day. The experiences have moved from out there to in here, from physical to digital. And this is the bit I really like, actually. I think it's really interesting. From communal to familial. You think about how we used to go out and we would, you think about the magic of a pub or a bar. The magic is you talk to people you don't know. But now we're much more stuck at home, of course, in our little bubbles. So it's, we're, you know, our connections are not as wide, then, or especially our physical connections. So I thought that was a kind of interesting idea. I'm thinking here, how can we make it communal again, as well as just familial? Because those weak links that we have lead to interesting ideas. So what I thought I'd do is I'd share some examples of post-coronavirus innovation. Um, many from the UK, some from outside of the UK. And then I'm going to issue a call to arms that we all think about doing these experience twins. OK, so here's one. This is lovely. This is uh, th there's all sorts of socially distant cinema ideas coming up. There's drive ins, there's cycle ins, there's this. This is a float in. There are 16 boats. This is in Paddington in uh, West London. And they can fit up to eight people per boat. Not, not cheap for a boat, 200 to 250 pounds. But, you know, if you take uh, your whole bubble, your family, that's fine. Um, and the films they're showing are like Titanic and Jaws. This is brilliant. Secret cinema. If you've never been to secret cinema, if you come to London, come to see a secret cinema event. It is phenomenal. Basically, what they do is they take a, a movie like a Star Wars movie um, and they turn it into a... a What's the right way to put it? It's a kind of fiesta around that film. You dress up as a character, you turn up, and then you get to play the game, essentially. My brother and I, and actually some friends from California, we went to see the Star Wars one, and we met uh, Han Solo. My brother and I got thrown into a prison with Chewbacca. We negotiated with the Jawas, and we had to run away from Darth Vader. It was incredible. And these guys, obviously, they can't do that at the moment. So they did a lovely idea, Secret Sofa backed, as you can see, by Hagen Das. On a Tuesday, you get an email telling you this is what you can do to build your own mini secret cinema kind of event. So you have the right kind of music. Um, you can dress up in these this way. This is the kind of food and drink to eat. Um, and then on Friday at 730, everybody watches the film. Um, this is lovely. This is from Poland, from this gallery in a place called Elblag. And they just cut the grass differently. They cut the grass in a way that made it very clear where you can have a picnic. And they did some workshops here as well and where you shouldn't to keep people socially distanced. This is brilliant. The world's first socially distanced rock concert. It was in Newcastle in the northeast of England. And it was actually a kind of pop up. It was at Newcastle Racecourse. And they created this Virgin Money Unity Arena, they called it. And it can fit 2,500 people. They've been selling out all summer. They've had rock bands. They've had um, comedians. You can see here what it looks like in real life. They've also had you know, famous people like Van Morrison, Ronan Keating, and the British comedian Jimmy Carr. I don't know about you, but it looks a little bit weird. 
you know, the idea that you'll be in your own little cage, you're kind of, you know, humans are caged in. But on the upside, that means that you and a bunch of friends get to go to a concert. You know, how can we be together but apart? Okay, this is wonderful. This is uh, over in Toronto. These guys had um, taken a heart, you know, taken the rights to and a whole bunch of um, art from Van Gogh and then Corona hit. Uh, and they do do something where you can walk in as well. But I love the driving experience. Ten cars can come into this huge warehouse and have, I think it's about half hour experience where you have music and the art. I just think it's really clever to bring um, art into a driving experience. Um, digital amplification is an obvious one, but I like this. This is a, a Samsung's Experience Store KX, which opened in January 2020. Some of you on the call, you may also be in a similar situation where you started something and then Corona hit. And here, what's nice is they were gonna use this space for experiences. They're now using it to do um, what's the right word, kind of mini experiences, and then they're broadcasting them. This is obviously designed for you to watch on a phone, hence it's in portrait. And this was, is with a girl who I think is a musician. I'm too old to know about this. Um, and uh, she got to use the Samsung stuff. I think it's really nice. This is a wonderful example. Airbnb, you know, very, very quickly flipped their experiences, which they've been doing very well with, and brought them online. This is a lovely example from Lisbon, um, where this drag... Um, group who are all um staying in isolation together already they did like online sangria classes and performances this is really interesting from brian chesky one of the founders of airbnb we're no longer thinking that this is just a temporary product for the covid era we think this is a new form of education and entertainment where you can not only travel without leaving your living room but you can now do it in a really interactive way I got some skepticism around that. You know, I'm a big fan of VR, but VR is not the same as going to Paris. VR is not the same as seeing the Colosseum. But at the same time, we can bring the destination and the experience to people where we need to. So the questions I'd love to ask you are, who are your connections? Your commercial connections, your cultural connections, and your personal connections? Because I bet you know people in the UK. I bet you know people elsewhere around the world. I would love you to think about and create a setup where you have an experienced twin. I want to help facilitate that. And I also this odd experienced twin. So if you work for a destination um, a marketing company, maybe what you should do is you should connect with a museum. Maybe you should connect with an escape room. Um, I, I'm going to mention I'm setting up something here called the WXO, the World Experience Organization, to make connections across the experience economy because I think we all have something to learn from each other and that will make us stronger and create better experiences. What I'd love you to do is to use this, um, this link, tiny.cc experience twin 2020, the E and the T of experience twin are capitals. And when you go there, it's got a set of questions. It's who, who are you? What's your email? Um, but it's also who's your experience twin going to be? And when you do this, you're going to be on my list of people that I'm going to share all this stuff with. That's another thing. So here's my email as well. I'd love to hear what you think of this. Obviously, we're going to have a bit of uh, Q&A now as well. So I'm James at the fish. It's the future is here. James at the fish .co. Please send me an email because I'm going to I'm very happy to share this deck, of course, and very happy to share these coronavirus era um, innovations, because as Brian Chesky said, what we're going to do here is create newer, better ways to entertain connect with surprise delight um people and therefore make money for our destinations make money for our organizations and create a better world of of experiences thanks james that was fantastic bang on in fact 10 seconds to go fantastic so we have 10 minutes apparently that's me ray professional <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, so we have 10 minutes, so now I've, I'm gonna let James read through some of the questions that have been coming in, but if I just kick off, James, then you can then pick up on some of them, okay? okay. Uh, there seems to be a, 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 a few camps. Uh, uh, one is, is a really interesting one, uh, and that's about environment and sustainability, and if we actually are uh, trying to expand tourism, and what impact there, there actually is. Because obviously, um, <laughs> if we have a reality which perpetuates what we have in terms of polluting fuels and the like, yes, of course. But the, the point about imagined realities is that we're going to move to somewhere different. 
So what is the imagined reality when we do have battery technology, you know, or other forms of, of uh, sustainable renewables? You know, will we have planes that actually can fly with the sun? That's not inconceivable. You know, if Da Vinci was around today, he'd be drawing pictures of what those vehicles actually were. Okay, so I'm I'm a great believer in um, in the uh, technological entrepreneurism, but there has to be a need, and that need is generally created by legislation. So you know, it's very hard to put entrepreneurism when there isn't a viability, and sometimes I uh, either uh, legislation or even trade agreements or whatever. So I'm really hopeful that the entrepreneurs can really help us out there and then we can all travel but the other interesting thing that's actually come out of covid is that we are getting nearly as close to a garden city idea as we ever have over the last 200 years and that's because we've realized we can work from where we live and that where we live isn't a dormitory uh, town for the city and so all the transportation now these will create schisms and economic problems i'm sure but those will be reconciled and so the cities become less intensified uh, and, and more beautiful but equally the high streets will regenerate and i think that's spread and as i said love your love your town and people will come to your town and that will decentralize so i, I actually believe there will be a, 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 a really sort of a splattering of tourism as opposed to centralization and that's why we're picking up on second and third cities rather than capitals uh, because i think capitals have got an interesting uh, challenge ahead of them in their own right um, wow. You know what worries me here, Ray, is we've got two yeah. optimists on the call. <laughs> we need a pessimist here because I'm an optimist too. There's this wonderful term I came across called the opportunity. Yeah. And there's a big belief in VC circles now that just as the internet was the big idea and was the as the the area of possibility and the and the way you can make money uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, now it's the um, it's solving the problem in the environment. Um, I wrote yeah. something to the Telegraph the other day. And I spoke to this guy who set up the, uh, this, the second um, British energy unicorn worth more than one billion pounds, uh, Octopus Energy. And he was just, you know, just saying, you know, that's where everyone's excited about. I'm involved with an accelerator based out of Cambridge, um, run by a guy at Cambridge University from the business school there. And the energy that, I mean, they've raised a couple of million pounds just to get some startups going. But the idea is that we will solve these problems. And if you look at, um, you know, look at airplane travel, you know, go back to the Wright brothers. It took quite a long time to go from the Wright brothers to kind of anything approaching mass tourism. I mean, it took, what, 60, 70 years. But we've already seen uh, those planes that have gone around the world using just uh, batteries. And there's that company in uh, Canada that is now operating a small um, a, a small fleet of seaplanes, but it is battery operated. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely positive uh, about this. Brilliant, James. Now, another, another question that came in, which again, really interesting, huh? and it sort of fits into this, but, you know, is it about, uh, are we exporting UK culture? Or is this about local? No, I'm very much about local. If I'm working, say, in Krakow, yeah, I'm developing that as a wonderful place, which attracts people, yeah? Similarly, if I'm working in, say, Bristol, the opposite happens, yeah? That's so this true. is a universal, it's all about local culture. And interesting enough, the, the art question came up, uh, now, what we do know is that about 95% of all art is sitting in basements, you know, trying not to decay and has an insurance bill attached to it. You know, I'm a great believer in getting that, that amazing uh, content and resource out um, so it can uh, create experiences and joy, but also raise, re raise revenue in other places. So, so again, this idea of de decentralizing and, and, and then going into other places. Now, we've done that in the work market, you know, um, you know outsourcing to different cities. You know, like the Met Office went down to Exeter. Uh, and that just gives me a chance then to segue away into this idea about weather. Um, so we created a philosophy called Weather Enhanced Visitor Attraction. Now, everybody thought that was me being South London, calling it weather as an acronym, but <laughs> it wasn't. It, I, you, I don't believe there's any such thing as bad weather. Uh, so if you go to Glastonbury, you almost rely on it to rain, so you come home muddy. You know, it, it, you, you know, we, we, you know there's... there's, there's to the, the total tourism product yeah, needs to adapt to the climate where it is or where it's changing too, interestingly enough, because we do have climate change. Now, whether we can halt that or whether we just work with it is an interesting question. But, uh, but the idea of weather being your brilliant resource, 
very famous uh, science museum in Sweden where they turned the car park into an ex exhibition hall because it had no capacity and they couldn't raise the money for a new building. And the peak day turned up to be when it snowed because they could do real experience and real experiments. Yeah? So the car park became the new museum. You know, so it's very interesting about how you can adapt uh, to the circumstance. But whether, I think, for those that are seasonal, there are parts of the, of the world where it's not seasonal, but we are lucky in Europe, for sure, you know, where we have a seasonal and we have those four wonderful moments that we should exploit and enjoy. I think I'm just, again, we're just going to agree this is a problem, right? Because I, I saw one of the people on the, uh, Juliet Fritz said, uh, wear weather appropriate clothes and stay outdoors. As a very bad sailor, there's a, you know, there's a saying in sailing, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad equipment. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with a chap who runs an outdoor um, adventure tourism uh, product in Argentina about a year or so back. And we agreed that the best time to go outside is is when it's raining. One of the interesting things, just my local park with my kids, if I go when it's raining, it's quieter and we really get the space to ourselves. But I, I, I agree with you. It's it's more an opportunity than a kind of problem. Obviously, you know, you have to have the appropriate clothing, right? But things look different. And one of the things that we talked about with this, this chat from Argentina was about how one of the magical things about the world is it can make you feel that you're there. In this book that I've written, Time and How to Spend It with the Science of How to, uh, you know, design experiences that will lead to more happiness and enjoyment. One of the key things is it's got this seven rule structure. And one of the rules is intensity, which is about flow, getting people into flow. Flow is it's a psychological term. It's, it's key for happiness. And flow doesn't happen when you're passive and you're kind of sat back, not doing very much. Flow happens when you're challenged and you're doing something that's challenging and one of the interesting things that weather can bring is it can push you into that moment so yeah. weather can be positive yeah, exactly and also you know i rely on the five senses uh, if you wish to look into it there's another 26 apparently uncommon senses i haven't got that far yet but the five senses would do me but you're absolutely right you know um a drop of rain suddenly the whole of the aroma changes mm. um you know, even our, our, our rela physiological relationship to the context changes. So if it's humid or if it's not humid, if it's hot, you know, and, and if we know our audiences, and this is something which is really important to all uh, destination attractions, yeah, know your audience, because if you know there are people that don't like the sun, mark it to them when it's not going to be sunny. If you know people that like, uh, like the cold, mark it to them. So make your imagined reality absolutely pertinent and experientially wonderful oh, yeah, target audience target yeah? yeah and we don't do that enough we work on what i call the brontosaurus uh, uh, <laughs> but what we're doing now is actually filling up you know what used to be called the shoulders i don't see that anymore i see it as a flat model so if you look at the harry potter um and leaves them where there are five thousand people a day every day and it's a flat model 365 days of the year now that's beautiful in terms of operation but also in terms of sustainability because you don't have stress and you don't have redundancy so but those are ideas yeah but we need, need to know our audience you know and that comes back to what do you want to be so the big question is what does say the uk want to be what does europe want to be what does north america want to be but what does the world want to be that's an interesting imagined reality moment because it's so small the world now. now once we once we define and decide what that is then we work really hard towards it and make it the best possible version of that genre you know and then actually people can make a choice about where to move move around to or actually stay put i'm a great believer in if you have a wonderful place to be why move you know that's an interesting that's because idea. you live in croydon that's right yeah. you say that because you live in croydon oh, no i live in arundel funnily enough yeah oh, okay. I, I, oh beautiful I, wow yeah. okay yeah. So my, that, was, that was a real, that was my children choosing that location. I think right there, my children, because it had a castle and it had a duke. Yeah, so yeah. you get you get the sort of point. I sort of live that ideal, you know. But that was a reimagined, you know, reality for me. That's probably true for everybody. Can I add in a couple of things about what you're saying? I, th I think that, um, and I want to reply to what Jenny and Sam were talking about about people who are, you know, with disabilities or where older people who feel. Uh, vulnerable in cold and wet weather and you know it's not gonna be so positive for them because clearly Ray and I are both very positive people who can see the positives but what you were talking there about talking there about um, uh, you know not the brontosaurus model which is kind of seasonal but actually always full and identifying your your target audience that's right for you is so important um, I don't mean to refer to Joe Pine all the time but he talks about instead of marketing we should talk about 
customering. And what he means by that is there are no markets any, anymore because actually you're not selling to a market. You should be selling to individual people. And in the digital world, we are able to, you know, this idea of mass personalization, mass customization. That's what we should be looking for. But it's really identifying. Uh, OK, I, I think the idea of customering is, is slightly silly. And the idea that you're going to have true, perfect one to one marketing. Wow. That that is a, that, you know, Amazon can do this. OK, depends on, you know, the um, AI capabilities you've got backing up your system. But you can definitely go from a general market to your niche market. And there's something if you're if you're trying to be for everybody, you're going to have that. If you try and be for your core, you're much more likely to have what you, you were talking about there. And thinking about what Jenny and Sam mentioned about, um, you know, older people, more vulnerable people. Well, understanding that niche understanding you know those people what their challenges are means that you should design things around those people there should be something for those people so if you were designing your destination if you're designing your product your service your experience once you figure out who are your people go design it around them but i'm also going to flag up the idea here that if we work together with this twinning idea then i bet you somebody out there maybe they're in montevideo Maybe they're in uh, Baltimore, maybe they're in Birmingham, maybe they're in Berlin, has got an idea of something they've done. And what we do here is it's, it's what um, Picasso is said to have said, great, good artists copy, great artists steal. If we get lots of these ideas and share them between our twins, we can come up with some better ideas to help everyone create better, more accessible and relevant experiences for people. And that's where the uh, the workshops really come into play because when we host those um it's very much about the local we're looking for the gaps we're looking at the capacity expansion in those products locally uh, as i said if you can love your own place then people will love it as well uh, and um and i see an explosion of localism i really do you know where the coffee shop in the high street yeah will will blossom uh, you know the local shops will blossom you know, it's interesting. We've been trying maybe for a couple of decades to uh, reverse or even um, um, restrain this movement of out of town shopping or, or in the wrong places. And now you wouldn't write this script, but hasn't he exposed something, you know, very, very dangerous, but actually I think potentially quite beautiful. Um, um, so, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And in terms of the term post COVID, I don't think there will be a post COVID. I think they'll be living with COVID. And uh, we just need to manage uh, ourselves around this, you know, in the same way we do with very many other, um, you know, uh, problems in the, in the world. We have to manage ourselves. If we do get a, a vaccine, fantastic. But if we don't, you know, we, we, we can't come to a standstill. And I think this imagined reality could actually go into two directions, you know, you know post-COVID or actually living with COVID. And there's an interesting discussion. Uh, just maybe to finish with, uh, James, yeah, the thing about imagined realities is they are imagined. We don't know what those are yet. And, 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 and so this is just pregnant with possibilities, you know. But it is about the people actually putting themselves forward in their opinions, you know, not closing down uh, what, what that possible reality could be, but opening up to everybody. And I think democracy could be a very interesting beneficiary for this if we have leaders that then can actually play that game really well as well. That is, um, I love your point there about imagined realities. Um, because the magic of imagined realities, we can reimagine it. It's quite simple to reimagine. It's a bit like the digital world, is you can change a website quite quickly, but actually, you can change what's in your mind quite quickly. And I was listening to a um, podcast that, last night, and, and the, one of the great things about humans, of course, is that we have an imagined reality and then we can go make it happen. And actually, I, I think, you know, the, what you do in your workshops, Ray, uh, you know that work that you've done over in Canada is kind of go how what how can we how can we imagine how this will work so instead of having the bron I love the brontosaurus you know the seasonal uh, demand we can keep that constant and we can rebuild in that different way and one of the things this this company Coeli that I'm working with next week is they're in a great they're in a terrible situation of course they, they've had to let huge numbers of staff go it's it's horrific but they're in a great situation in that not quite ground zero but things are so kind of like wow they've got to do something and that gives the opportunity for innovation i've seen a question here from rose lee thank you how do we find a twin in another country uh, my background is i'm a 
journalist and um so therefore i uh, it's my job to go research and get in contact with people what i'm hoping to do and if you fill out the form or send me an email rosalie and anyone who's also got that same question in fact one of the i suspected some people say well hold on that's easy for you to say um but my intention is that let's say somebody else comes to me rosalie and says how do i find a twin somewhere else and it turns out they're in a different country to you perfect we connect you and I'm just going to flag up here that it, it's not, it doesn't matter if they run a different kind of organization and face different challenges, because that's where great ideas come from. And if you think about sapiens, you think about the, you know, the long arc of human cultures, great ideas happen when you get these periods of peace. They talked about the Pax Romana and there's this idea of the Pax Mongolica, when the Mongolians kind of basically came through and that they created this amazing corridor from east to west. Which, which, and what happens then is you get people with different ideas come together and then good ideas come out. And they also talk about the post Second World War Pax Americana, because what we, we live in a time where we have brilliant people who have ideas that we don't have. You know, the, the magic of Ray and I presenting this is we are two blokes from the southeast of the UK with some ideas. We don't have the ideas. And what's amazing about innovation workshops is that you get a bunch of people together with different ideas and it turns out that the person you weren't expecting to have a great idea and a bad idea turns into a good idea when it's smashed up with another one so that's why i think this tw uh, the, the twin town the twin experience idea the experience twin ideas is trying to facilitate a real world work. maybe we'll turn it into workshops we'll see but the starting point is let's just share some ideas because from those ideas better ideas come now, I think it's now gone call to two, James. Now, I don't okay. know if people have just naturally turn us off, which would be an incredible button, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> people have been searching for that. Certainly the kill people, button. They, they've never found the off button. So I don't know whether we just carry on until, you know, we get a phone call or whatever, or a message. Uh, but I'm prepared to carry on uh, if people are out there still looking in. Um, How can so we tell if it, is everybody, is anybody, Charlene is typing something it says here. So that yeah. means there's one person. Let's continue. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, and the, the, what I love about this notion of twinning, yeah, because it, 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 it sounds very human, which I, I think is fantastic, yeah, because uh, empathy, I think I mentioned it before to you, James, empathy is a fantastic thing. Uh, it's actually about when you synchronize emotions and even physiological attributes. And I think if you've got a, a city, a town, or even a street yeah, that has similar attributes, you know, beliefs, values, what's of it, you naturally find a twin because we gravitate to people with like minds. Yeah? Now, if you take that on a national scale, guess what? That turns into trade. You know, we have the same values about trade. You know, if you turn it into the world, we have the same values about climate. You know? so, so the idea of twinning and tripling and da 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 da, da so it, yeah. And then we have to find probably a planet you know, where there's other life forms, and then we twin with that. You know? I mean, that, that, that's <laughs> you know, yeah, but, but let's deal with the world first of all. You know, we, we have enough challenges there. But I, I really like this notion of collaboration, sharing of ideas, because that is a very outward looking um, society, not an introverted society, yeah. which always leads to its own problems eventually. It never succeeds, actually. Can, you know. can I just take this? Because Ian's just said we've got two minutes, and Charlene's asked a great question, if you don't mind me taking this. Your experience to an idea sounds great. Do you see it as promoting intra regional travel in a region where tourism has become a mature industry? And I think absolutely. And the thing about twinning, while I'm, I'm I think we should reach out as far as possible. We should also reach out locally. And if you think about Ray's work in terms of working with Banff and Alberta and Edmonton, someone that goes to one of those places, well, hold on, maybe they want to go to the other place too that, that's, and see something else, something that's different about that area. And, you know, you think about this is why brands happen, right? This is why uh, brands are a really smart idea because once you've got a four seasons in one place, you get a four seasons type of customer who then trusts and wants to go to other places. I'm not, saying we should have cookie cutter i really believe in differences but if you are connected charlene with another organization that seems to, that maybe has a similar target audience you know the kind of let's say i don't know your experience but let's say it's kind of like you know rich high culture and someone else has something that is within half hour 45 minutes or a couple of hours away maybe it's a really good idea because what you're going to be doing is enhancing that experience for your customer and building business at the same time well, it's interesting. We, th we, we worked in Egypt um, until there's a little bit of a problem there, actually, you know, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. 
And there they were trying to create this two center idea, which the Americans have done for years, you know, the seaside and then the theme parks, maybe, mm -hmm. in Florida. Yeah. Um, and we were looking at culture, you know, in the, in the true sense, you know, old buildings, old societies. Yeah. And then the, uh, you know, the Red Sea. Yeah. And what's interesting, those were two separate uh, entities. They never crossed over. Yeah. And our job was to mix them mix them together. And so what we did, we brought some culture to the Red Sea and we brought some Red Sea to the culture. And anyway, it never took off because obviously Egypt uh, had, some, had some challenges and problems. But that, that idea of, of, of mixing, merging, you know, jamming, jamming these, these things together, you know, a mashup if you like, because there's always a gap. And therefore don't cannibalize, elaborate. And, and that then, then you have this decentralized notion and then you start to have, you know, the one day day trip turns into the weekend or turns into the week, you know, um, uh, attraction. Now, I always remember when Bob um, Rogers designed the NASA Space Center and he was petrified uh, that he couldn't actually get migration from the hotspot of Universal with Disney and the like, you know, 50 kilometers out to this site. He shouldn't have worried because the fact is there was a gap and this site had different experiences because it was an antidote to, to what was brilliant in Orlando, you know, and, and of course NASA then was different to Orlando as well. And so, so I think he's actually looking at the experiences, designing that imagined reality, marketing it brilliantly, that's another essential, yeah, and then, then, and then exceeding the expectation that's sown in the seed of the tourists wherever they may come from, whether it's locally or, or wherever. And also the local market, we, have, we, we also have the donut effect, where we talk about where nobody around the attraction goes to it because they live there, right? Oh, yeah. You know, if you think about it, school children finish at 3.30, they should be going to all the local attractions, but the program has to be there. It has to be attractive. You know, it can it, you know, expand the curriculum easily, you know, so the after-school clubs become the attractions. Um, and I've just been told to shut up, which, you, yeah, which is a fantastic <laughs> note to end on. Yeah, uh, and, uh, Ian didn't say that. Uh, but uh, no, that's been fantastic, James. Thanks for joining Thanks, me. Ray. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Everybody, and any follow ups, please contact either ourselves or Ian, and we'd be delighted to talk to you, meet you, or anything else. Thanks, James. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everyone, for coming. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye.